And this, yeah, this will make it accessible with the account that you can use to get the video with, right? Yeah, I've been, by the way, I've been lately getting into a good habit of uh, either that day or the next day down, downloading the, the recording from the cloud and putting it up on the, um, the CES meetings uh, playlist under the Agoric channel. Um, yeah. Um, we've got quite a long list of, um, of recorded meetings uh, up and accessible in chronological order. Yeah, so, so I've also explored the idea of live streaming to YouTube. Um, and I think what we could do afterwards is uh, see if we can live stream it into a private channel. And then uh, you guys can say, okay, you know, from your end, you'll be able to say, yeah, yeah let's uh, make it public afterwards. Because I, I know we need that little bit of uh, the five second um, after the meeting ends for people just to make sure that there's nothing uh, in, in cameras and all of that. I don't understand. If, if we're not live streaming it to the public, and I certainly would be opposed to live streaming it to the public. If we're live streaming it privately, how is that different than recording it privately? Oh, because after the live stream is done, it's a YouTube video that can be replayed and can be made public. So it just saves the effort of doing the download upload. Um, it goes directly to YouTube. It's private until you say, OK, now make that a, a, a permanent video, not a live one, and make it public. So, OK. Um, uh, sure, we can, we can try to do that sometime. It sounds like it's not that much different than what we're doing now. Oh, just the workflow is more automated. That's yeah. all. You know? um, okay. But I mean, you've already kind of automated yourself on the workflow. So. <laughs> yeah, it's become so. a habit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So, Karidi, your three topics. All right. Let me share my screen here. Um, not really three different topics that are very related, but I think three, I have basically three questions that I would like to get a, some feedback. Um, Okay, where to share here? Share my screen. So the first one is uh, part of the feedback that we got uh, on the meeting, or I got offline feedback from some folks. And uh, the first one is really about the global and the disvalue. And uh, the recommendation was to only have one of them, the global object, uh, name global this. Um, so no need to have the init option passed to the constructor anymore, because when you create a row, it creates a global object, and that global object is accessible via a read-only uh, global this member, uh, member uh, or field in this case. Um, the the backstory on this one is that in the past, first iteration of the Realm API was supposed to allow you to provide a, 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 a proxy handler for the global object, assuming that the global object could be a proxy. And there was a, some cases in which, in order to implement something similar to the window proxy in browsers, you need to have a clear separation between the this value uh, and the the global object. And the this value is really sort of a membrane because it's not really a proxy of the global object, but a proxy of a shadow target that allows you to point things to a, any object in the future. Um, so there, uh, somehow we still have a separation between the two pieces. And I feel that uh, the feedback is correct. It should be only one of them. And if we ever want to implement the, the window proxy, uh, we should be able to do so via the compartments or evaluator, whatever we call it. Uh, so so the, first of all, that all sounds good to me. Um, the, uh, uh, right now, the compartment uh, API also just has one accessor, currently named global, probably to be renamed global this. So having these be exactly in sync on that. And it's also, we're also in sync that we create the global when we create a compartment. Um, uh, with regard to being able to emulate the window proxy, uh, I agree that we need to figure out how to do that. I agree that uh, it'd be perfectly fine to do that only at the compartment level. 
whichever way we decide to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say it's, you know, to, to, for me at least, it's not a priority to be able to accurately emulate the browser window proxy. The browser window proxy is not a proxy. Um, uh, as you said, it's proxy-like. It forwards to an underlying um, window, uh, which where the underlying window is never reified as an object, uh, but it does things that a, pro that a proxy cannot emulate. Yep. So uh, yeah, that sounds fine. If we if we're good with mm, removing that from the realm and saying this is in a different layer and we will figure it out, that's fine. That's that, I think that's a good yeah. answer to this. Um, yep. I so I'll go ahead and make those changes. So those are really easy changes, and it simplifies even more the API. Okay. The second second question is: um, Does anyone else has any comment on these, or should we I, jump I, into? I have a, a a minor point of misunderstanding. I hope it's minor. Uh, is the is the um, the interface that you have currently displayed? Before or after this change that you're discussing? Be before, before. This is the current, the, we, the one that we present. I see. Because I, I confused by global and this value. Yeah. So this one, this one, this one will be renamed to global this. This okay. one will go, will go away. Okay, that's This much one will go away, and this one will go away. Good. Okay, I like Good. that. Uh, in, w in which case, the Realm API is almost exactly a subset of the compartment API. Let me go ahead and, and do it right now so we can keep it here. Okay, good. I like that. Uh, so it's just going to be like this. Okay. Um, so the second one, the second question is related to this API as well. And it's specifically about eval, which we have been trying to avoid for a while. Or I have been trying to avoid it getting into that conversation. But there was a very good feedback from some uh, framework authors and and Daniel was the one channeling some of that. Uh, the, the situation is that obviously if you're running on the web and you have a CSP uh, enforcement to avoid uh, inline, to yeah. avoid eval, basically. You, yeah. You're not able to, to, right. to evaluate in a, a string source. Um, um, you will not be able to use the ROM at all. And, and that is not acceptable for some people. And I, I, I think I agree with that. Now, the interesting part of it, which I didn't realize before, and he is sp spent time, Daniel spent time explaining this to me until I finally understood, understood what, what he was trying to do or say, um, is that in the web today, even if you have enforcement for, um, for not in line evaluation of any kind, you still have the ability to do an import, dynamic import. Right. You're able to dynamically import anything uh, as uh, as it goes through the network and gets evaluated. Yep. And and uh, with the ROM API, we don't have that capability because in order for you to do a dynamic import, you have to call eval. And so, what, go ahead. The, um, so we addressed this at the compartment level. Uh, let me just suggest at least as an exercise that um, the Realm API here, uh, since lines two and line three is redundant with the compartment API and the compartment API uh, is where we're going to deal with, with the whole uh, import namespace loader thing, and also dealing with this issue of how do you start if you have no dynamic evaluators? Uh, we could have the, we could replace lines two and three of the Realm API with a getter to get the start compartment of the new Realm. Yeah, I, I'm once again I, I I may have missed a stitch of the narrative. Without the evaluate, how does any code get into the realm in the first place? Okay, so let me let me explain that from the compartment point of view. Well, it's the compartment story that, that Mark just told, I understand. But this, okay. with with people objecting to evaluate, 
in this interface, I oh, don't. So there's, there's a distinction between evaluating evaluable strings, mm -hmm. which requires that at the time you evaluate it, you have a parser, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I, I raise the parser as the way to, to as you know, as, as the uh, example to drive this because it's coming it's coming from TC53 constraints. It's parallel to the CSP constraints, but it's much clearer for the device thing. You have a much stronger separation, um, uh, but it's, it's a similar issue. Um, uh, in any case, uh, in the uh, so the so the thing that's that's missing um, is where does the preloaded static module records come from? And in the web context, I think the natural answer that's already, if I understood correctly, um, uh, Caridi's assumption in the realms is the realm, the realm API was going to pass through host hooks, whatever the host hooks associated with the constructor from the realm that it's in, from the compartment that it's in, uh, when you create a new realm, it just gets the host hooks according to the host. But the realm API is not trying to redirect host hooks. And but the, imp the issue of import namespace uh, and where those things come from is much like the issue of host hooks. So what the compartment uh, API provides, let me, let me just finish the sentence. I understand that you're not understanding something, but let me just finish the sentence. Um, so the compartment API provides on the compartment instance and an explicit import method and an explicit uh, import sync method, both of which take specifiers, not module source code. Okay, that I, I, I like that. Um, I, I, I was just given the realm API as it's uh, 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 described. Um, um, you, I mean, you could, you could uh, have, uh, so there's two things you can do with the realm API. Uh, you could, um, Actually, if you just have the realm give you back the start compartment, then the just let the let the start, let the compartment API handle all of this. That's that's fine. Uh, what I was what I was where I was was losing the thread of the story was if you take out evaluate, how does the realm get any code at all into it? Right. Um, I mean, it's it's basically this empty sealed box that you can't reach into. Right. Uh, Caridi's code that he's typing there, um, the r.intrinsics is um, a, a, a pathway that I had, had thought about, which would let you get to eval, but uh, per Caridi's comment, um, mm -hmm. CSP may, may screw you there. Um, CSP needs to screw you there. If, if it doesn't screw you there, then CSP has failed. Yep, it, it, must, it must prevent you from doing any kind of evaluation. Right. And once again, in the TC53 situation, where you don't even have a parser at runtime, um, uh, uh, those have does to fail. CSP block you from opening iframes? Uh, CSP does, uh, does not. Does not. But uh, realm that does anything but, wait, at all. Wait, 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 wait. But I, with, the, with, the, with the R dot import explains, um, uh, and whether we put an import method on realm or we just let, give you the start compartment is uh, something I think we should discuss. But either way, I think there needs to be an import method uh, such that anything where you're already in an environment that somebody's going to provide module static records to instantiate, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, this accesses whatever the already provided uh, module static record uh, provision is. So, so, so Chip, just to clarify your initial, your previous question, if you, if you have the CSP uh, rule to disable eval, you still can create an element that is an iframe and attach it to the DOM. Uh, uh, everything works just fine, but you are still not able to call the eval from that iframe. Yeah. 
Uh, Karidi, okay. on, on the last line in the, um, in the editor box there, uh, just for uh, uh, clarity during this meeting, uh, could you rename the accessor from compartment to start compartment? Sure. I, I, it's too long a name to actually propose, but I think it's a good, good thing to keep in mind. There are many compartments in that realm, and the realm constructor, I mean, the realm instance is only aware of the start compartment. Yeah, so I, I feel that um, my my personal opinion on these aesthetics and uh, educational aspect of it, I feel that uh, it's fine if the realm provides a subset of the APIs that you can get on a compartment. Um, if it is easier for people to just get it to work and it doesn't depend necessarily on the compartments to be fully specified. So I, that, for that reason, I, I prefer this one. Um, to just be here and internally delegated to the compartments when it exists or whatever. So, um, so what do you think about having an accessor on Realm for the start compartment, regardless? Because I because I don't have a full and this is my third question going getting into the compartments. It's my feedback for compartments really. Um, uh, what I what I because I'm not sure about that yet. I rather prefer to have something concrete that will go out there saying, you can create a ROM. You can evaluate code by accessing the eval uh, if you want to. You can import any specifier, it works fine. And by calling import on it, and not necessarily having to depend on the compartment in any significant way that people have to learn about it. Because you don't have to learn about the compartment to still use the, the ROM. So, uh, so that that's um, maybe maybe we can talk about the the compartments yeah. and then come back to this question again. But yeah, the the I, I want to separate uh, the uh, the timing issue from the design issue. Uh, I understand with regard to the staging process that uh, we both want the realm shim to proceed ahead of the compartment shim through the staging process. Uh, and um, uh, although now they're sufficiently decoupled that they actually could go either way, uh, but the, the realm, that you're really preparing the realm shim to go through the staging process early, earlier than the compartments will be ready. Uh, so I understand timing wise why you want to avoid a dependency. Well, not, not necessarily about timing. Uh, and in fact, uh, my discussion with some folks this week were about whether or not we should wait for the compartment or the evaluator to be ready. And, uh, and, uh, and some of them were saying, well, it seems that it must be ready um, before the realm if it is really tied up. But it's more about what exactly does the star compartments offers? Because okay. you well, cannot well, configure that. You don't have a way to hook into things because it's already created. So really it's only about okay. being able to access the, the APIs that it offers, okay. uh, which doesn't give you that much control. Could uh, you bring, could, Gritty, could you bring up the uh, proposed API for the compartment? Because, um, I'm just trying to see what is in there that's not in here. Uh, let me see which one should I click yeah, on. This, it just, this yeah, one. Right there. that's right there. Okay, yeah. so you've got the get global is going to become a get global this. Uh, the evaluate, uh, I think you should go ahead and add the options back, but otherwise our evaluates are probably the same. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we've just talked about you adding an import that takes a specifier. Um, this one here. Right. Uh, and the import sync thing will be, um, you know, that's something that that is only going to be resolved in a compartment uh, time frame anyway. So if you just adopt the rest of it uh, such that we're such that you know the two groups, um, you know, we, which is you know both of us on both groups, we're both, we're both champions on both. Um, uh, the uh, as long as you know are, we're committed to trying to keep these things in sync, 
than just saying that the realm has the compartment instance API for the behavior of the start compartment, uh, that that is the view of it from the compartment view of the world and from the realm view of the world, it just has the behavior that we're going to be specifying for the start compartment anyway. didn't quite understand what that means. Are you saying that you prefer to have the dot start compartment or that you are okay with having the dot import and the dot evaluate? I'm, I'm okay with the dot import and the dot evaluate and the dot global this. Uh, and eventually, uh, assuming we keep it and figure it out, eventually also the import sync uh, because then uh, and, and that in general, what we try to do is we try to keep the uh, instance API uh, in sync between the two proposals. As both proposals advance, um, if, if one of them adjusts something that we both try to pay attention to figure out whether we can keep them in sync, and we only let them get out of sync if there's a very good reason. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. So you're saying option one is fine for you. We yep. can uh, keep the same API. So this one is missing options as well. Yeah, because essentially what that means from the compartment view of the world is that the realm instance is also essentially the, uh, the, the compartment instance for the start compartment. You don't have to get these. You don't have to get the compartment instance for the start compartment. It already is the compartment so instance. Normalized API circuit. Okay. 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 All right. So I'll, I'll go ahead and let me let me update API then here. It will be around uh, having a import here that gets a specifier using a string and returns a promise. Uh, of a namespace object. Yeah, of a module namespace object, exactly. Um, uh, and the then uh, this uh, one has one, a yeah. option box, which is going to be the evaluate uh, options. And, yeah. Uh, the interface for evaluate options is going to be a very simple one that maybe type on it or something like that. Right. Uh, well, I mean, well, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be just the normal options back where we, we add more properties over time uh, and right. we to pure data. Yep. Okay. Okay. In interface. Line one. Interface. Uh, uh, Kriti's writing in TypeScript or TypeScript ish. She's not writing in JavaScript. I, I understand. He just, yeah, yeah, it's a typo here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. It's an interface. Oh, I see. I see. Um, just bugging my OCD as well. Uh, okay. So, uh, about this one in particular. Yeah. Um, one thing that was uh, also discussed is whether or not it should return uh, the result of this evaluation. So, I think the answer is yes, that it returns the completion value. Uh, I hate the completion value, but uh, the reason why it's, it's there's the, what people sometimes do is they give to evaluate an expression um, uh, if, and, uh, and when they give it an expression and they're using it as something to evaluate an expression, what they clearly want is the value of the expression and the expression interpreted, interpreted as an expression statement as the entire program you're evaluating does give you back the expression value. So I think it has to. Yeah, the, 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 only, the only thing problematic about this is that it is a foot gone because people might think that by just accessing these, they could do all kinds of things and they might be leaking objects and such. Oh, they could oh, do oh, via intrinsics oh. and all that, but I mean. Yeah. Uh, no, I know, I see what you're saying. This is the Realm API. This is, 
one realm talking about another realm, so you have a cross realm boundary. Yeah, yeah, I mean, which is the same here, anyway. So you're getting a name in space object that is also. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean. And, and and you have the global this. So for all of these, uh, let me bring up something that's kind of been in the back of my mind, but I haven't mentioned it before. Uh, what your what your guys are doing at Salesforce and to use realms has been working because you always place a membrane. Yeah, realm you, you never has access to the other one. I think user land can 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 be um, okay. Yeah, it's fine. What, what do you? What, I mean, what do you think about having the realm? API only give you, I'm not even sure what this means, but only give you membraned access to the other realm. And I feel that, and I will touch on these on the next topic, uh, which I feel that is more about us giving the layers and then people use a land, they might create abstractions on top of this to eliminate this potential problems as we do in the uh, in the in the new thing that we're building at Salesforce so like okay well the nature of a realm is going to give you those objects and you might mix and match those objects incorrectly so instead of um, telling you about it we, we give you an abstraction that does not allow you to mix and match anymore uh, and that abstraction is fine it's user land abstraction and it's fine uh, so I, I I won't be able to react to that until I see it. Um, you, do, until you see what the the the, the what the user what, what a user land abstraction on top of this that that's preserves its usability looks like. Oh, yeah. The, 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 um, are you following what we're doing on the on this one? Uh, it's been very active. No, I'm uh, sorry, I have not. Uh, so we're, we're 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 doing a bunch of stuff in here with this one. Uh, we have a lot of tests and uh, um, a lot of stuff in there that are really interesting in that in that regards because you will be able to uh, create a realm, uh, but the API does not give you access to the internals of that. Um, an example is I think is in here where you create a. a when you create a new new environment, uh, the the objects that you pass in in the distortion map are objects that uh, are in the, in the current realm, so they belong to the current realm. And then what you get back is a function that is equivalent to the evaluate function. Basically, you can call it with the source text that you want to evaluate. And the return value is never a thing, it never returns anything. Uh, it evaluates code, but it doesn't return anything. So it, it, it never leaks anything. Um, and therefore we are able to preserve the, se the semantics of the membrane, a complete separation between the two realms. Because once you create an environment, uh, you never have access to any object from that environment. You only get access to an evaluate function that, when you invoke it, goes and does that internally in the in the other realm, and the return value is not leaked back to you; it's protected. And if you want to do any sort of uh, uh, special behavior, you have to do extra work to communicate the internal and the externals, and those extra work will always be uh, enforced by the membrane. So never, it never so, leaks anything. So I don't understand the point about not returning because you've got a membrane. Membranes are bidirectional. Uh, if you returned a, um, a a blue object, uh, it would still come back as a yellow proxy for the blue object. Right, right. You 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 suddenly do that. Uh, the the situation that we have right now is that because we don't know. So a couple of a couple of notes on that. Uh, First, we don't know if this thing is going to be evaluated synchronous or it's going to eventually be evaluated in a different process or something like that. It makes it a little bit more difficult to, we could do that by returning a promise of the result or something like that. And uh, that was something to, to keep in mind. And the second one is that- uh, 
promises obviously have to work through membranes. Yeah, 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 yeah. A promise is fine. It's a promise of the result, and we could create that as a possibility there. Uh, the the other one is that uh, in many cases the, the because we're using eval here for this source text, the completion value there is potentially different if you're evaluating a script. And then there's a confusion of whether that evaluate is really eval or is it a script equivalent, inline script equivalent evaluation. So we're trying to keep it out of the question for now. I say you don't have a return value. But yeah, you're right. We could, we could return the blue side of things. Um, if, if in fact, the... in fact if, uh, sorry, sorry, Chip. I mean, in fact, if you throw an error, you get a blue error. So I'm, I mean, I'm, you're, it seems like you're doing a lot of work manually that membranes already do for you. Uh, if you just took it, let me just, just hypothetically, let's say that the realm constructor here didn't get, gave you back, uh, you know, created essentially the same realm instance, but didn't give you the realm instance back. Uh, it considered the realm instance to be blue because the realm instance gives direct access to blue objects and then it just recur it, it just returned it through the membrane so that the realm constructor just directly gave you membrane access to the realm instance and then everything works just like it works on the realm instance it's just that you're operating it through a membrane yeah yeah i, I, I haven't spent too much time on that part of the thing but um we're keeping it as much restricted as possible for now. Like it doesn't return anything. It's easier than having to explain what it returns. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think, well, the thing that Mark said, just said was clarifying to me, but it, because it struck me that, well, the completion, the issue with the completion value is not that it returns you a blue value. It's that you, it, it has this weird, completion value thing going on, which might mean different things in different contexts, right? Is that uh, right? So it actually doesn't. Okay. So uh, scripts. Uh, okay, okay. Then if you have the realm, whether you, if, even if you don't choose to return the completion value from evaluate, you've still got the global this and the intrinsics, which lets you get at objects that are there. Yeah. So it's not protecting you from seeing things that you're not supposed yeah, yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's that's what I was saying. Like you're getting the name space, you're getting these, you're getting right. that. So it's already a full gone everywhere right. uh, from right. that perspective. So, so. so it doesn't seem like it introduces any new complications. I think the thing that Mark just said is is simpler and cleaner. Except how are you going to pull that off without introducing membranes as a new abstraction into the whole TC39 process and equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is like a giant can of worms yeah. that you don't really want to have on the critical path. Uh, yeah. So I, I agree with both of that, even though they contradict each other. Um, uh, I mean, we know from experience that using this API without a membrane, people will get screwed. We just know that from experience. I mean, yeah. we, we trying to be as careful as we could possibly be repeatedly created security holes. Right. Um, uh, right. The expert marksmen keep shooting themselves in the foot. What's going to happen when you hand the machine gun to a monkey? All right, so I'll, I'll update this. Um, seems to be fairly simple to go with um, and powerful enough and to get people to buy into that idea. And then, um, yeah, those, those are the changes, the only changes that I, I feel that we could we need to do before going back and try to get for stage three. Yeah, um, with nothing... regard to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't remember anything else that is pressing for stage three to yeah. be considered. Um, so, I th th so I certainly uh, uh, do not suggest bringing up a membrane issue um, uh, before stage three. Uh, I think the thing that would it would be very nice to establish is that user code 
could, could easily, let's say, replace the realm constructor with a, a membrane realm constructor. Yep. Uh, such that uh, each time it creates a realm instance, it only gives you back a prox a, a membrane proxy for the realm instance. Uh, and let me check with you, Kriti. Um, all of those separate things you were showing me, uh, is it the case that if you simply took the realm instance that we're seeing and you put it on the other side of a membrane that all those other issues would be taken care of for you? Can you say that again? In different all, words? <laughs> um, in different words. Um, so you had a, like a, a separate evaluate method that was designed for use across the realms and all that stuff. What if we got rid of all of that and all we had was this API, but we created the instance, if you're creating a blue realm, that the realm instance that gives you access to blue objects, that that, that realm instance itself is considered blue and uh, it what's and then it, the that instance is returned through the membrane, so the caller of the of the, you know new membrane realm, the caller of the let's call it membrane realm, the caller of that of that constructor, what it gets back is a yellow. Assuming he's calling it from yellow, uh, he gets back a yellow proxy for a blue realm instance. If mm -hmm. we that would we would we then not need uh, any of those other membrane management APIs uh, that you were showing us? Uh, well, I think it, you, know that, it. So I, 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 if I understand your question, is whether or not we having having something like that will eliminate the necessity for an abstraction there. Um, and I feel that the abstraction is still needed because you you might want to decide what are the things that you want to map between yellow and blue. Uh, the things that we talked the other day, like whether the set has to be reconfigured and such, uh, okay. or a map or something else. Okay, good. And good. there are many other features that you want to have as an abstraction that we know we could do it, but I, not, not necessarily a need for having that as a part of the language. Okay, I, I agree. With, I agree. I agree with it not being part of the language. Assuming that we can make it very easy to use and teach, starting from somebody who already knows the Realm API, they can just start to use it through a user-level membrane abstraction. If there's really, you know, minimal difference. So in the so can all of those um, things that you want to map can all of those be expressed as distortions? Hmm, I don't think so. I think so. Can you come up with a counterexample? Uh, uh, the distortion, at least in the way we use it, and we haven't found, in fact, okay, let me step back. And maybe this is a conversation that we should have in the upcoming meeting where I present what we have um, in a more realistic example, something like, uh, I have something open here, I think, uh, let me see. Uh, like a, a to-do MVC where pieces of the to-do MVC app are inside a sandbox and others are running in the current app and how they interact with each other and such. I, I feel that the um, some of the characteristics of what we're doing in terms of distortion is a one-way distortion only. Uh, what means is that when you create one of these sandboxes, the objects that you are disturbing, you're just disturbing the reality of how the sandbox sees the outer realm. Uh, and the distortion is described as a outer realm object to another outer realm object mapping. And, and this, this helps to uh, uh, contain what the sandbox can do. But once it comes to the sandbox, sharing object with the outer realm, uh, that distortion doesn't have to necessarily be taken into consideration. And in fact, those becomes features of these infrastructure. I, this is very abstract, but the fact that I'm giving you something, I'm in the sandbox, I'm giving you something back, but the thing that I'm giving you back 
is something that you send me initially as a distortion. Uh, what are the implications of that? Should that be rewind to the original object that was mapped to the distortion? Or should that be the object that I'm seeing as uh, through the membrane as a reality of the outer realm? And what we discover is that it actually is a feature to not rewind back to the original object, uh, like a reverse distortion as Marx mentioned at some point. Um, those yeah. for us are actually becoming more of a feature because it offers a lot of protection for other things. So we, we could chat more about that, um, about that when the time comes, but... Um, okay. Yeah, do you have a name, the, the particular membrane, membrane that you're doing, which makes it seem like everything's in one realm, uh, uh, assuming we, we do the whole extreme thing that we talked about of patching all of the primordial methods that access internal slots, um, like, the, you know, like the date methods, mm -hmm. uh, as an example. Uh, do you have a name for that membrane? Not yet. <laughs> Looking for a name. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have any suggestion? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the name to be coined. Yeah, I don't have a suggestion yet. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to call it a near membrane until somebody comes up with something better, because it makes it seem like all those things that are out there in other realms. It makes it seem like they're near when they're actually far makes it seem like they're all here in your own realm. Yeah, yeah. I okay. like that. Okay, so a near membrane. So the, th so the thing about, so the near membrane can only be done at the user level if you patch all of the primordials that modify internal slots and pay a factor of three over, you know, do, turn one function call into three function calls on the happy path and worse on the unhappy path. Um, the, so I think clearly when we want to use such a mechanism, when we want to do near membranes in production, we would really like that to become platform supported uh, and a, you know, so that, so that it's, you know, the, the thing about patching the primordials is not just that you patch the primordials, it's the patching has to be in bed with the near membrane. The near membrane is only transparent when it's working with the patching of the primordials. Mm -hmm. And they have power to, you know, they, they're sharing power that they cannot expose. So I think that the near membrane really needs to become a membrane-like thing that's directly provided. Yeah, we can. We we we. we that, uh, that's an area that I want to explore for sure. Yeah, yeah. So certainly, do not delay this from stage three because of that yeah. consideration. Um, but I think that. Uh, that is something that we want to explore as uh, something that might become an upgrade of the Realm API as opposed to a separate abstraction that composes with it. Because uh, otherwise it can't be in bed with the primordials. Okay. Um, all right, so any, anything else about these or can we jump into my third question? I think we can jump. Uh, does anybody else have anything? Okay. All right. Um, let's see, evaluator, this one. Okay. So I have a few conversations this week with a few folks about the, the presentation about the compartment. And I also watched the, the video. I could not be there live uh, for the presentation, but I did watch the video a couple of times already. And so I, I tried to compile. Uh, it's it's much of my notes I I I, I call. So the, the the biggest question is this, and I will send it. We'll, we'll say it before everything else. The the, the real question is, um, is the compartment API 
And this is my question, my question. The, is the compartment API something that can be created on top of uh, a more low level API that the language can offer? Or is the compartment API the right uh, level of abstraction for the language? And so, this is an honest question that I have. Uh, so and, and, and to be more specific or precise, uh, most of the problems that uh, we debate this week among a few of us were uh, around the fact that the current compartment API as presented does have uh, limitations in terms of what you could do. An example out of it is the static linkage of uh, the map. Where is there some background conversation going on? Is that is that Oh yeah, I'm sorry. That's me. That's me. I, I, I'm a bit uh, chatty here, but I can try to move to a different area. But uh, yeah, um, Karita, can you make sure to share a link to this page? Yeah, let me share it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll tell you how I'm thinking about this with regard to compartments because. I think we are getting at, the, you know, from what I'm seeing here, I think we're trying to get at the same things and we should have one proposal that satisfies all the needs. And I think, um, I think that, why don't I actually, why don't I let you continue to explain this before I start reacting? I'm trying to find a chat here. <laughs> Where is it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know where to put the link, but the link. Um... Just send it. Send it by email to to uh, the the SES Google group. Okay, I'll, I'll do it out right after. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So. Let me let me see if I can uh, explain. The I was saying that the input map is is an example of these limitations because now you are bound to a static map that you must have, where we can always say that if we have the dynamic hook, um, you will be able to implement the static map if you want to, uh, versus. If you do a static map, there's no way you can do any dynamics uh, whatsoever on the resolution of the of the module. That's an example of it. But uh, it feels to me that we could go very low level with the evaluator API um, in a way that the compartments can be implemented as a user line abstraction on top of these very low level API. That's that's just my my, my intuition here is that we are. Uh, going uh, very high level with the compartment API. And that might be a problem for okay. some So, so, so um, let's see, is this a good point for me to react or was there more? No, yeah, that, that's, that's about it. So I, I come okay. out here, so, so history um, of all my nodes and try to put it in a way that okay. it might be more easy to do, debate it. Yeah, so what I was imagining initially was something much more like the API you showed here, you're showing here. Um, it was the collaboration with Modable that led me to the compartment API. And I think both the TC53 scenario and the CSP scenario, uh, both of those push us hard uh, to something like the compartment API being directly supported. Um, because uh, the compartment API lets you take uh, static, a, a set of static modules that might already be uh, pre-compiled and evaluated uh, and lets you repeatedly instantiate them, link them and wire them up together in different patterns to express different kinds of, of least authority relationships. Um, uh, and uh, it separates that 
from the issue of where do static module records come from. So the intention was not to have an API that prevents dynamic loading of modules. It was to separate concerns. Uh, and uh, Michael Fig, are you on the call? Okay, well, um, the, so one of the things that I did in the uh, compartment presentation, um, uh, oh, Michael Fig is on the call. Okay, good. Um, one of the things I did in the uh, compartment presentation is I used in the comment for the module map, uh, the notation that it maps from name to name or module namespace object. And I, the nota with the notation, I was being purposely ambiguous as to whether that, that mapping is provided by a function or is provided by an object. Um, and uh, what, I what, I had it, what I have in mind, what I'd like to explore is whether we can separate the concerns such that uh, uh, you can provide a, um, you can provide in that function uh, a, uh, essentially a loader, that the loader could be hooked to that function so that when you do have the ability to dynamically load modules, uh, that uh, that turns into uh, the, um, a demand that's expressed through the namespacing. Um, uh, so basically, we have a loader abstraction that's distinct from the compartment abstraction. Oh, yeah, they're, okay. There's a very simple way to explain this and make this much more too complicated. There's two phases, and, we, and each one is a separate concern. It took me a long time to see this clearly. Um, I think this is well divided in Michael's API, but I just wasn't seeing it, uh, which is there's a lot of phases of stuff to go from module source texts that are in directory somewhere that need to be reached through IO, going from that to a bunch of module static records that are locally available. And the loader should do only that. And then the compartment should be the thing that does all of the initialization and linkage that goes from module static records to linked instantiated initialized module instances. And then with those two things separated, a TC53 scenario would be one without a loader and a CSP scenario would be one in which the loader is uh, disabled. Or at least some of the functionality is dis disabled. Uh, certainly, uh, like what you have um, uh, uh, where you're parsing a module and then you're taking a parsed module and turning it into and linking it, obviously you can't expose something that goes from source code in a CSP no evaluation world. That's just as bad as a runtime evaluator. So what I'm, what I'm seeing here altogether on this page is that uh, some of this page just becomes the compartment that we've got. Some of the page, like what's shown here is the eval init, uh, it become the uh, host hook part of the options record to the compartment constructor, which we've been needing to specify. So I'm very glad to see this. Uh, and then uh, the rest of this page, I think goes into a loader abstraction that plugs into the compartment abstraction. So just to clarify um, more things, um, I think I agree with everything you're saying. Um, still thinking, but so 
part of the refactor that you mentioned in the call, that's definitely something that we should do. It's not part of the, the proposal, as you mentioned. It's just we just need to create the pull request, make the organization better and such. Uh, that's something to be done, no matter what. Um, the the cases of the let me give you another example where we were um, discussing whether or not this could be a problem or is a is a because it is a high level API. The fact that you have uh, two things in the evaluation, you have the endowment somewhere, but you also have the global object some some other where. The, the, the endowments is really a trivial thing. We're just doing, we're just bundling that in for convenience. But it's exactly the same thing as creating a compartment and then doing an object to sign onto the compartment's new global. Right, There's and and, and then and then we 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 are we are also missing something that uh, in the current API we're also missing the uh, important piece that at least in the past was an important piece which was the ability to control the contour, uh, or at least to have some sort of uh, uh, way to control the contour uh, when evaluating code. And it, it, it's it, it, in the, it relates a little bit to the things that we, that we are currently doing at Salesforce, where we are having a hard time because we do not have the contour control. Okay. Having, we are having a, have you ever run into code that actually makes use of the code? Right, that's the, I was about to get to that and we'll give you a, a, a specific example. Um, so when you're about to evaluate code um, for the evaluation that you're about to run, if you have a little bit of control over the contour, you're going to be able to set up things that are only going to be reachable by the, by, the, uh, uh, by the code that you're evaluating. And you don't have to lick it as a global reference because otherwise uh, you have to put it in the, in the global as, a, as we do today with the caveat that the first one to access it has to remove it from the global and such. The, the same tricks that we were doing in the realm chain. And that's just because uh, you want to enable access to a piece of code, but in order to enable access to the piece of code, you have to go and place it into the global, which might be reachable by someone else that you don't want them to reach it with. Um, and and we're, we're, this is an endowment specific behavior. The endowment sure. behavior doesn't necessarily have to be placed into the global and placing it into the global automatically makes it more harder to control who access that. So, uh... So we've actually gone back and forth over this. Uh, an earlier form of the compartment proposal uh, also had the ability to pass endowments uh, in evaluate. So they were specific to that evaluation. Um, uh, it, uh, as I, so I see your global contour is an evaluate options. Yep, for uh, evaluation, yep. So yeah, so this is exactly parallel to what we used to have. Um, and we realized something at least for that. Okay. So, so let me speak specifically about the TC53 scenario. Um, uh, uh, because what I was present, part of what simplified what I presented there is I only presented the subset relevant to a TC53 scenario. Uh, in a TC53 scenario, um, there uh, is no sloppy mode, and uh, there's both modules and scripts. Um, you know, scripts optional depending on whether, depending on your runtime configuration. We don't want to be able to to support evaluating scripts, but. Uh, uh, we're only considering, we're, we're given that we have both modules and scripts evaluated as evaluable strings, we decided that um, 
for TC53, we did not also need to support uh, uh, scripts evaluated as global code, i.e. the way script tags in the browser are. And a strict eval evaluating code as eval code, uh, its top level declarations, the declarations themselves do not become uh, bindings in the global contour or, or the global object. That top level declarations are contained within uh, that evaluation all by itself. So at that point we realized we don't need a global contour because the only thing that ever puts a binding into the global contour is, a, is either a top level declaration in sloppy evaluation or a top level evaluation of where you're evaluating code as global code rather than eval code. Those are the only cases. So I I I think I catch most mass of it. Uh, the, the but but I still think that the the low level API where you could provide a contour that is in fact uh, null or something like that um, allow you to support those cases where you don't need a contour. You don't want a lookup in the contour because. There is no way to put anything in the contour, and you should be able to specify that by providing a contour that is either empty or null or something like that. But but saying that there is no contour control then eliminates the possibility to do something where the contour okay. is actually put on. Okay, so we've got a we've got an implementer resistance issue on this because. Um, uh, so, so here, okay, so here's the question. On a, um, a, a full JavaScript system, uh, where you're starting with, with full JavaScript and then using API to build uh, compartments and evaluators and all that, starting from full JavaScript, let's say that we'd supported the contour uh, for that and even maybe supported sloppy mode and even maybe supported evaluating strings as global code. There's a lot of things that are relevant to full JavaScript that are not relevant to TC53. Um, uh, so I could imagine that we decide to support all those things for use there as long as um, they're optional and, and, and separately separately described enough that we've got a full working system for the TC53 scenario that doesn't require implementers to, to add a lot of bookkeeping that's not really relevant to them. So the particular implementer resistance we ran into is that the way in which um, uh, TC50, sorry, sorry, the way in which Modable implements their compartments and their evaluators is such that per evaluation endowment, as opposed to per compartment endowment, would be difficult for them. And, it's, and the fact that it's both difficult and not needed for any of their scenarios, I would like not to make it needed so i'm still confused on one piece of it which is you still allow them to provide endowment per compartment um, per, per compartment um oh i see because you're doing it at the compartment level you add it to the global and you don't do anything at the evaluation level right exactly because that's where they that that's where they have the bookkeeping set up is on is is on a per compartment basis and in fact, they're set up to be able to provide a global contour as long as it's a compartment wide contour. And there's just no, and, and for assess machine, there's just no reason to have a, a, a contour at all. Well, because compartments are cheap. So 
contour doesn't actually buy you anything additional. The uh, what the, there's one thing the contour there, okay there's one it's use case make another compartment. Yeah, there's one use case for a compartment that um, uh, that I take seriously and um, for a compartment or a contour. I'm sorry for a contour. Thank you. There's one one use case for a contour that I take seriously and still makes me have misgivings with dropping the contour for the CES machine, um, which is the one Mike Samuel brought up, which is, uh, can you, in a situation where runtime code evaluation has been turned off, specifically in that situation, um, uh, can you, um, Can you look all if, if runtime evaluation is turned off, then you statically know every line of code that's going to execute in there. Can you, with a reliable static check, detect where in that code a particular dangerous object first is accessed, first becomes accessible, such that it's then only uh, becomes accessible elsewhere by contagion from that first point. And uh, uh, in the, because property, because the global object tends to get used for things, and because a property of the global object can be accessed with square bracket, uh, if you put something on the global object, you cannot reliably detect when it enters code. Uh, when it enters execution. If you put it in the global contour, then the only way, and, and you suppress all evaluators, this is the Mike Samuel observation. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is synergistic with the Mike Samuel observation, uh, that the only way that that object can enter execution is by mentioning its name, and therefore looking for a free variable use of the name in the static code that you're auditing is a becomes a reliable check. And to me, that's still a significant argument for introducing a contour. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and this one, I imagine that this one could potentially be a proxy that allows you to identify what's going on with it. Um, and what kind of lookup you're doing on the contour and such. Um, and in the past, Dave, was pushing very hard to, at some point, making sure that this is provided because he has some other use cases uh, uh, um, that I don't remember very clear now, but there, there are uh, quite few cases where he wanted to really control the, the contour and having the, the ability to uh, reset the environment by resetting the values on the contour and then starting over and such. Okay. It seems to be an interesting conversation to have. Okay. How would you feel about the contour being per compartment rather than per evaluation? Then it's a little bit more, more tricky because if you really want to have different uh, evaluation with different contours uh, or even, um, yeah, you have to create different compartments and the cost of creating a compartment is going to be a lot higher. The cost of creating compartments should be, if, if the cost of creating a compartment is non-trivial, we're doing something wrong. Well, you're creating a new global object, right? Yes, um, that is true. You have, and you have to populate that global object with a bunch of descriptors. That, that, that is the main cost. Is, yeah. And by the way, which I wanted to ask about something. It, we, this probably doesn't work, but if the global object inherited the, sh the, the descriptors for the shared intrinsics, rather than having them be own properties, what would break? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think about that. Okay. So in modern VMs, well, the beefier VMs, they have a lookup table for most of the built-in stuff, and it's only when you mutate things that they actually need to perform an allocation after the initial. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, uh, that, that's why a few, few months ago when we explained what we're doing with a detached iframe, um, that's why 
uh, we have to do an operation that access one of the intrinsics to get them ready before detaching. Otherwise, some browsers will just have issues with it. Okay. Because so, the allocation happens lazily. Okay. So, so other than implementation performance concerns, we, we can come back to that, but just semantically, uh, it's, if, it's observable, right? It, it, it's still it's observable. It's observable. That's why I'm asking what practically what would break? I don't know. <laughs> I'll think about it. Okay. Um, are we including web compat in that question or? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure some things break. I just don't understand what. Yeah, the, the, the other thing um, that we talk about is the, the window proxy and how that could be achieved. Uh, and you, you know, there are people that are feeling strong about that as something that we should get uh, specified. I, I, I think we should, I, I, so I agree with what you said earlier uh, today, which is uh, we do need to deal with the window proxy eventually. It can be the compartment that deals with it rather than the realm. But the main thing, the main thing is that uh, uh, we can introduce that in a later phase. It, it, figuring out the window proxy is going to be a mess, and it should not block this thing going to phase three. I'm sorry, when I say later phase, I mean a later proposal. Okay. Right, and we can always add things in a later proposal. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, about this in particular, I'm a little bit concerned because uh, it might force us to make extra changes. If we, if we don't, if we don't find a way to do it, even if we don't, we at least we should validate that it's possible to do it with what we're moving forward. I agree. We should, we should validate that it's possible. I agree. We should have a, pr um, uh, and I think that's a good strategy in general is to say, Here's how this expected future thing might look that establishes an existence proof, but then we're not confident that this is the way we want it to look, so we're not proposing it now. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so there's the contour controversy. Um, uh, let's say that we add the contour to uh, evaluation uh, as we were originally proposing um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, so at that point and we do the separation at that point this thing basically becomes the combination of the compartment proposal and the yet to be written loader proposal right 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 um, the loader aspect of it is an interesting one. I don't know how much we want to go into that. But so initially, when we were working or crafting the initial API, um, we, we were saying there is obviously the need for parsing source text that returns this thing that we don't know what is it. But now it's more clear that it's the static uh, module record, right? Um, yes. Um, yeah, that should be uh, that should be essentially a reified form of exactly the static module record. Yeah. And now, from that module record, what kind of operation? Once we get an object out of that, no static module record must be immutable. You don't link the static module record. You make a module instance that mm -hmm. points at a static module record. So the same module record can be instantiated multiple times. That's the essential mistake that was made in the spec as it is, and that's the most important thing we need to refactor. So, okay, so um, the, the, the assumption here in this line here is that this is in fact a instance of the, of the uh, parse static record. That, yes, that's, that's a, static module record uh, and it's immutable it's there you cannot there, um, yeah so that's that's just an immutable record let me let me re reiterate here the assumption is that once you parse the source 
this thing is internally a record that you can share for that source among different realms. It doesn't matter. That's right. The, right. And then per, the static per, module record is itself, uh, uh, there's nothing in it that's realm specific. Right. And then uh, per, uh, per realm or per compartment, I don't know yet. I haven't think about it. Um, those instances that you create uh, could be linked together and and the linkage will require to okay. have access to the names that you want to link that you must link so the um, so the second part exactly the first part uh, is is exactly not is link is not a a a method on the parsed module record because the parsed module record doesn't know anything about linking to things. It is just something that module instances um, are instantiating the static module record and the in module instances are linked. Yeah, yeah, so they, let, me, let me see if I can articulate this better. The, if you look at these, uh, uh, these, uh, these API, um, the, the user never create an instance of a module. They do not have the ability to even uh, attempt to evaluate a module graph. Um, that's something that is beyond their control and they don't have a way to do it. The only thing that they can do is, is return it uh, a, a, a ready to go module graph from the corresponding hook. Okay, which... let, me make, let me make sure we're talking the same language. Mm -hmm. A ready to go module graph is obviously must be a graph of module instances. When you say module instances, are you talking about something that give you access to the name space object? No, no, there, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yes. A module instance has a namespace. Right, that, that's where I have the problem. Uh, I, I feel that we're, a, a, again, getting into the territory of the uh, food guns where they uh, have to deal with modules, name, module name space records because you allow them to intervene in the module graph and play name space object into that module graph. Uh, you are immediately uh, uh, potentially leaking objects that should not be uh, accessible from within the current realm that you're evaluating. Uh, I, and so, I, I didn't understand that. Let me let me try to articulate it better. My main concern when it comes to namespace objects is that the minute the namespace object is a uh, is a commodity in the in the creation of the module graph. Uh, I feel that it's very, very easy for people to trip by just simply creating a module graph that includes objects that belong to a different realm uh, by just assuming that they can just simply place it there and now be part of the module graph that is accessible from within the, uh, the realm and the evaluator or the compartment in this case. So, so, the, so the, let's separate Anything you do cross realm, anytime somebody is trying to do something cross realm, nine, nine times out of 10 at least, they will shoot themselves in the foot. Anything cross realm is a foot gun. Uh, being able to, to link across compartments is exactly why we're introducing compartments. You have to be able to link across compartments or you cannot do least authority linkage. Uh, you have modules X, Y, and Z. X only needs um, to be able to import Y, Y only needs to be able to import Z. The Z that Y imports is instantiated with different globals than the Z that W imports. Um, uh, you've, you, you've got to be able to wire uh, these things together such that a linked graph of module instances are instances which have been instantiated in different compartments. If you can't do that, then the entire exercise is worthless. Yeah, I think that we found the, the contention point then. Because uh, okay. I, I, I believe 
it is, uh, this, is just an, this one's an absolute requirement that you be able to do that. We can argue about how you're able to do that, how you express it, and, we, and that's what we, you know, in these meetings, we've been doing that for six months now, uh, and I finally feel like we arrived at something I understand and that's simple and expressive, which is the new compartment API. Um, uh, but whether we do that or we do something else, or we do something lower level or higher level, the absolute requirement is that we be able to express that we want to wire up a module graph of module instances instantiated in different compartments where uh, we can, where the, the creator of the graph, the one who controls the handing out of powers and how things are wired together, gets to express how these things are wired together by controlling the import namespace that each module sees. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I get that part. Uh, I, I feel that maybe next week we can go over what we have done in this space uh, and uh, to give you a gist of it, uh, the way we have accomplished this uh, is by saying that uh, if you want to control the module graph, you can do it at the ROM level and then at the uh, different uh, players that you might have that did needs you, access did, to. Sorry, did you mean the realm level rather than the compartment level? Sorry, the, com the compartment level. Sorry, sorry, I'm still oh. confused by that. Okay. So uh. if, 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 um, let me, let me start over. Um, we believe that the linkage between namespace objects, uh, the, the linkage that represent the instantiation of the module graph, all the linkage that happens there could be uh, implemented in the same realm. And I'm saying realm here. While the, uh, uh, the particular code that has side effect inside each individual module could be delegated to a different realm. Uh, as, as a result of that, right. you have. Are you, are, are you, are you, uh, once again, are you saying realm when you mean compartment? Realm. I'm talking about realm now. Realm. Okay, then I'm then I'm totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why I say that next week we should go over this because I feel that this is something that we 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 need to get into the same page on this one. Um, I I feel that what you're saying that the linkage. Uh, the, the, the linkage between modules evaluated in different realm is a must. Uh, no, 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 no. The linkage between modules evaluated in different compartments is a must. I'm trying to understand. Which the, 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 the global authority that a module has is essentially through three namespaces, uh, all of which we're bundling together in the compartment abstraction. There's which global object it sees, and therefore what global variables it sees. Uh, we might supplement with that, that with the global contour if we do that, but let's leave that out of the conversation for the moment. Um, there is its import namespace. For different names that it imports, what does it get? Uh, and there's its host hooks. Now, from what I'm seeing here, there's no controversy about the um, host hooks being per compartment uh, and the global being per compartment. Uh, and now the issue is uh, how do you wire the uh, import namespaces? And I think when you create a compartment, you need the same level of control over what import namespace the things in the compartment see, you need the same level of control of that as you have over what global do, does the thing inside the compartment see. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, simplify uh, or get to the contention point or at least to try to explain the it might be a vocabulary issue here. Okay. The, uh, 
what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say, I believe, is that I do not believe that uh, the linkage between two modules um, sorry, I, I'm trying to say that there is a separation between how the modules are linked together and the side effects of, of evaluating a module. And those are, uh, in my mind, two different separate things, um, which is achievable today by compilation, but we want to do that at the engine, uh, at, the, at the language level. And, and let me try to articulate that a little bit better. Yeah, well, but, but let, me just, let me make something clear, uh, just so there's no confusion. The module static record is, a, is also a state in which no, no module code has been evaluated. All, all module initialization happens only within a module instance, not within a module static record. I, I still think there is a fundamental uh, difference in the, the language that we're talking about, and I apologize for that. Okay. I cannot can make you my say, message uh, across. Okay. Can, can you say what you're trying to say with the language where you never refer to a module or a module record, and you only refer to static module records and module instances? Because as long as it's ambiguous which of those two concepts you're referring to, I won't understand. Okay, let me try to explain it in a, in a different way. Um, the, from, from the perspective of what we want to protect, at least in the cases that we we're doing today. Um, the, when you have a piece of code that is using certain things that are supposed to be provisioned by someone, whether that's a global reference or is in the contour or because you import it from someone else. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, the actual code that you're evaluating that has access, that requires access to those things um, can be contained somehow uh, in ways that you can actually uh, uh, protect against malicious code, execute uh, malicious code that is accessing those things. If you have a way to control access to those things that are required by the code that you want to sandbox. Yeah. And, and that's not different in the module system. It's just that today the module system is too rigid and assumes that if I'm importing something, um, I have no, no way to oh, intersect oh, oh. access to the, what I mean. The, the, the thing that is not possible in today's module system is uh, for a set of linked together module instances for some of them to see one global object and others of them to see another global object of, a, of module instances within one module graph. Sure, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to um, yeah, I'm very slow today. Um, I feel that I will have to craft some examples and such to try to communicate what I'm trying to say, which is probably something that we can do next week. Um, but in, in, in general, if I have to pin down the problem uh, of having a module that communicates with another module that is in a different compartment or in a different realm, uh, the biggest challenge or the biggest problem that I have with that is that if I don't have a way to be in between them and to, to um, modulate that communication, and when I say modulate that communication, what I'm really saying is we need a way to have a membrane in between. And if I don't have a way to have a membrane in between, then uh, that will be a bigger challenge. 
moving forward. So, so if you're saying that having two modules that are communicating with each other somehow, one is importing a function from the other one, and they belong to different compartments, or they belong to different realms even, because you could do different realms if you have the ability to pass a namespace object and plug it into the module graph. Um, and if that process does not allow me to uh, in, uh, intersect that uh, communication by putting a membrane in between, then it's truly a foot gun because people will, not, not only a foot gun, is that it's going to be impossible for someone to isolate between two compartments or two realms. So the idea of a general purpose membrane uh, at a linkage boundary is, uh, you know, where it's a generic piece of code for the membrane uh, is frankly something I have not thought about at all. It's a very interesting case. Um, what, what I have thought about um, uh, is, um, you know, this, let's, let's take uh, Peter Hottie's light bulb example. It's a perfect example now. Um, uh, we've got um, uh, application code that says import light bulb. It was written for a configuration where the, where the thing that it gets under the name light bulb is the genuine light bulb. Um, somebody now wants to attenuate the genuine light bulb. Um, so what they do is they create a module that expresses the light bulb attenuation. It does an import of light bulb and an export of attenuated light bulb. Um, the, uh, the code that wants to wire things together um, runs the module light bulb attenuator in a compartment so that when it imports light bulb, it gets the genuine light bulb. It takes the, but, but that module doesn't see any of the application's code globals. It only sits least authority. It only sees an empty global and an import namespace that, ha that, that um, has the light bulb in it, um, you know, the, the light bulb in the import namespace. Uh, then the application code is evaluated in a, in a separate compartment that's set up so that when it imports light bulb, it doesn't get what was originally the genuine light bulb. It instead gets the attenuated light bulb, which was exported by the attenuating module. Uh, that example is just, you know, basic capability 101. If you can't do that, you're not in the game. I don't think I have any issue with that. Um, attenuation process is fine. You define whenever you try to import from this, you're going to get this other thing and this other thing is supposed to know what it's doing. The, the question is- but that, you... but that other thing was instantiated separately. It was not instantiated with the same global and that's essential. Sure. sure. Um, the, again, the access to the global is just an operation that is going to happen uh, when you evaluate the code inside the module. Okay. And if you have the level of control at the module level to say, well, you're trying to access this thing, what you're really going to get is this sort of thing, uh, you should be able to, uh, to provide the level of uh, control that you need in this case. Uh, Again, I, I, it's very hard for me to explain these in words at this point. Yeah. I feel like so. So you're, I mean, you're talking about basically providing a function or something, providing something that gets called back by the by evaluation to say what global should I use in this evaluation? And, uh, we have twenty minutes. I can try to show you some of these. See if I can, okay. if we, we, we can make sense of it. Okay. Um, so let me show you here. Um, let's see if I can have an example pictures here. Good example. 
yeah, I think uh, this one, even though it's not up to date, but it might 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 do um, might do the work. So let's say that I have something like this. Um, and again, this is just a, a way to achieve the con the level of control, uh, not necessarily to 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 tell you how I think it should be solved at the language level. Just this is just a, 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 a trying to explain what we're looking for, okay. rather than how we're going to do it. Okay. Uh, but if you have a module like this, so this module is importing a binding from these other module, and is exporting two things: a function and a let. Okay. And and it declares. Uh, a constant here and might be using something else from global. Who knows what it's doing? And, okay. And and when it comes to the linkage aspect of it, yes, you're getting access to pool. This okay. is a binding that you're going to get. Just, just, just so make sure we're in the same. This code itself does not use any global variables. It does not, but we could add one. That's not a problem. Let's say okay. uh, we're doing a Let's just my, do glo that. my global here. Uh, okay. And that's the global uh, uh, lookup. Okay. And, and so when, when it comes to, uh, let me open this one side by side. Uh, remove this one here. It's easier to. So the, the, the assumption here is that, yeah, you need access to food somehow. Okay. And then you're doing all these things and you're giving up access to these two bindings uh, that someone else can import. Yeah. Um, if we say, that uh, when evaluating this piece of code, uh, we control access to food, so we can give you a proxy of food. Okay. And when someone else gets uh, import bar or Caribi in this case, okay. which are the two exports, they also get a proxy of it via membrane. Okay. Um, then. We can also say that the same happens for the my global, which is going to be accessed through uh, some sort of membrane that controls the compartment that you're running on. Okay. Uh, the vocabulary of the compartment. Um, you should be able to sandbox this code while still all the uh, module graph could still be the same module graph. Uh, you don't have to evaluate this code two or three times. Uh, the code belongs to a sandbox, and whoever wants access to that will have to go through a membrane that modulates that communication. Okay, so so there's two things you said that I that that seem to conflict. So I'm not understanding something. Um, the uh, so th this file is called input.js. Let's say that uh, somebody else uh, imports uh, um, in, uh, imports Caridi from input, uh, and you want them, you want that module to get not the Caridi variable that's shown here, but a um, a, 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 me a membrane proxy yes. for that variable. Okay. Actually, let's let's do bar since since the value of Caridi is a scalar. Uh, I just want to avoid confusion. So if they import bar, they don't get the function; they get a proxy for the function. Yep. Okay. And and so, the reasoning and the, uh, and the reasoning behind that, um, to just to I think is an important reason, uh, is that uh, if we say that evaluating the input address. Um, in order to use these securely, you have to evaluate it multiple times in multiple rounds. It's probably not going to work. So the, the assumption is that the modules itself are uh, a, a in, in the current nature of modules, they are supposed to be evaluated once and link it. Yeah. So the re so so there's 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 many reasons why that won't fly, but I'll give you the 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 biggest the, you know the most pressing one, uh, which is 
many existing modules in the world that are otherwise safe have top level state, are mutable. Uh, and uh, it is often the, I mean, you know, the, the, the MetaMask guys uh, in doing lava moat and in doing um, uh, MetaMask snaps, I think mostly this is a lava moat issue, but probably it comes up for Bradley with the tofu for node as well. Uh, yep. Brad, you can let me know if it does. Uh, is that uh, sometimes uh, in multiply instantiating a module does not actually create a um, uh, a identity discontinuity problem, uh, but is uh, but is needed in order to ha to avoid a communications channel uh, between two importers. Right, but that's only that's only that's only if this is sure. Because it's no, not no, if it, it is it, no it, share. The, the, no, no, just just the let caridi equals one, and then the caridi plus plus. That's enough right there. If mm -hmm. two if two other modules, uh, A and B, both import caridi from input, and then one of them and they both import bar, and they they one of them calls bar, it'll increment the value of caridi as seen by the other one. And when you're setting up least authority linkage of modules, one of your choices should be to give A a different instance of this module than you give B so that they each have separate instantiations of the Caridi variable. So I can at least speak for us. Uh, with Tofu and Node Policy, we don't uh, flag on that because merely the identity of functions is enough to usually do this. Um, if you have two functions that are mutable in any way, which is our default premise, at least for our tools, um, you can just create your own property on them and do it. Oh, right, right, right. You don't even need this Caridi variable that's being incremented. Simply the fact that you're exporting an object that's not frozen already creates a communications channel. Yes, so we just say that that's out of bounds because it's too hard to do anything about. Okay, but but sometimes the when you so so what comes out of tofu is just a description of, of an existing state, but the the intention of tofu uh, is that it be a starting point for manually expressing least authority policies, and one of the least authority policies that you will need to be able to express is that uh, one subsystem importing this module gets a different instance of it than, a than another subsystem gets. Yes, you are currently capable of doing that. We could even, if we could statically determine that something is properly frozen, we could mark it as uh, what we called pure in the past. Good. Or I think we call it sanitized now. What was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, but 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 nevertheless, so, we don't, we don't, yes. we're, we're we're not using sanitized. Uh, we've play, we, we've we might we well. I've been occasionally calling it petrified. Uh, pure has a problem. Petrified is not great. Uh, we need to find good terms for it. Let's continue to call it pure until we agree on something else. Yeah, but so the determination on whether or not this is a brand new source text and you want to evaluate it as a brand new, you want to internship it as a brand new, it's a determination that you can do uh, independently of whether or not you're having the level of control at the evaluation of the, uh, of the module itself. And I will probably defer that uh, to try to get to the point or I want to make, uh, uh, which is that if the level of, uh, if, if the code that you're about to evaluate uh, and the things that the code needs in order to function can be controlled via a membrane of some okay. sort, um, then uh, it is possible that uh, the, the, the bindings that you need, which in this case are two of them, the my global and the full, can be modulated by that, by that membrane. Okay. And, and, and um, the way we achieve this today is by transpilation, and just to give you an example of it. But I think it's going to maybe get us a little bit closer to 
the same page and then we can discuss the, the implications of this. But let me jump into the output of this transpile code, which is very ugly, but it's going to get better over time. Um, what this is doing is it still preserves the original import. Like I'm importing foo the same way that I was importing it in Kiev. So that remains the same. And it's also still exporting two bindings. The same two bindings that we export in Kiev, which are Kariri and Bar. Okay. Um, so the, the semantic uh, of these, of the, 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 not the semantic, the shape of these module and the requirements of it are still the same. Okay. Um, and by doing that, what we do with the rest of the code, which is the actual code that gets evaluated, uh, what we're doing is uh, finding ways to make it into a sandbox that we can actually control what they are doing. Okay. Can, can you walk through the output code, please? Just yeah. Just so the output code is that we introduce this as an import. This is a module that we have to have installed somehow. And this evaluates a piece of string value into a, a sandbox. Uh, this is uh, a way to key that sandbox because you can have n numbers of sandbox. I call this untrusted. Um, and the code that I'm about to evaluate is actually almost the original code of the uh, of the input. Okay. Uh, I just make it in a string value and then evaluate it. Okay. Uh, and by doing so, I now taking control over the things that in my access from the global. So in this case, if, if imagine that this one wasn't here, uh, it's accessing Caridi from global. So it's going to go and do the regular lookup inside the sandbox. So it's going to get the global from the sandbox. Um, similarly here, if, uh, if, if, if I'm declaring the, the function bar, which is one of my exports, I'm going to export it on the binding bar, which is going to be defined via this utility method that allow me to uh, communicate between the internals of the sandbox and the actual module that is evaluated inside the sandbox. Um, so think about this as endowments. And in fact, that's what they are. Uh, they are, they are in, uh, uh, in this case, endowments, but hopefully in the future, there could be something like a, a contour. So not anyone has access to it. Only this code has access to it. Um, so when I say I'm giving you foo, I'm giving you the foo that I'm importing. But the fact that this endowment goes through the membrane because these impose a membrane restriction, what the foo that you get in here is really a proxy of this foo that allow me to control all the interaction with foo. But the binding to foo is still part of the module graph. It's still, I don't know if foo belongs to a different name space. I don't know what it is. I don't really care. I'm only making sure that when I see foo through the membrane, I see it controlled by the membrane via proxy. And the same for set, I'm setting I'm giving you the utility set, which is in the outer realm. This code runs on the outer realm. Wait, do so you I'm mean outer realm? Do you mean outer realm or outer compartment? I'm, I'm outer realm. In this particular case, this is running on a realm, okay. and this is running on a separate realm. Okay. And uh, could be a compartment if you want to, but the 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 assumption here is not really about realms of or, or compartments uh, separations, just about controlling what you're accessing and taking control of the uh, the code that is being evaluated as part of the module body. And uh, tricks like these. Okay, so, so obviously I hope you're not proposing that least authority linkage requires the users to run their code through a transpiler. No, I'm not. So that's why I was trying to say at the very beginning that I'm not proposing how to achieve this. I'm just trying to make the point that there is a difference between uh, wiring up different modules and the code that 
the, the, the module body aspect of uh, okay. evaluation is a different thing, in my okay. opinion. But, but and do, do, you, do you agree that what you're saying, the, the, the semantics that you're expressing here, that that must be expressible with the mechanisms we're creating without rewriting code? Right. Yes, I agree with that statement. Yes. Okay. And and uh, the what I'm the when I when I was trying to pin down the area that I feel is something to be debated is that I believe uh, focusing on uh, controlling access to the things that you are uh, that you require from the module body whether that's a binding for an import or a global. I feel that that's more important than uh, uh, trying to accommodate um, uh, the uh, evaluation of uh, the module multiple times because you need it, uh, you, need, you need to sort of uh, uh, a, because you want to eliminate potential identity discontinuity problem, basically. So if, if you say you want to avoid in the system that that that, that we are that we are describing with the compartment, where uh, all the code uh, could be in in different compartments or different realms, because you are handling the namespace object that might belong to a different realm, you are just hand it over as part of the module graph um, and you don't have the level of control to control access to that new name space that is coming from a different uh, module graph uh, from a different realm uh, it feels to me that it's going to be a, a bigger problem if you don't have that level of control okay so let me let me replay back uh, what I think I heard um, that we should not be trying to solve the multiple instantiation problem. So let, let's put that aside. Um, uh, I mean, we still disagree on that, but I think it's a, we can separate that disagreement. Um, when you evaluate a module body, we should be providing a API so that someone who sets up a linkage graph among modules with the intention of having different modules have different authority that it parameter it, it provides um, uh, through something like this evaluate sandbox it provides the arguments needed to control what environment the code is evaluated in. In other words, the, um, all of the, the things that, um, so it provides basically on a per module source code basis, you want to be able to arrange that when mo that module source code is evaluated in order to uh, become an initialized module instance, uh, you from outside the linkage graph want to be able to say that module should execute in the ex this execution environment with this, this enclosing scope and this import namespace, et cetera. Is that, is that about right? That you can that you can intervene on a per module basis and say for particular modules what scope it's the module body is evaluated in. If if uh, let me see, so we're trying to translate that into the the current spec. So we if we say that the when the module body is being evaluated. Oh, uh, you have a way to control uh, access to the module environment record, for example, which has all the bindings 
that you might be importing. Um, and also controls the access to the global object uh, lookup. If yeah. you have anything in your module that uh, uh, requires access to a global binding, okay. um, that seems sufficient, yes. Okay, so you, so you wanna basically be able to, to say before a module graph gets initialized, you want to say this module should execute with this module binding record and that module should execute with that module binding record. Yes. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a module binding record and a compartment? Uh, it, it's a good question. I was, when I was about to say the, I, a few minutes ago, I said, I, let me try to translate that into the current spec in my mind, as well, I was just thinking about, well, how does that translate to the compartments API? Yeah. Or, the, or to the compartment concept, uh, as it comes in. And there's no different, like saying, oh, I want this module to belong to this compartment. And I want this other module to belong to this, this other compartment. And these other module to this other compartment. And that's, I have my graph. And, and that compartment might be a different realm. Uh, could, could be a different a compartment from a different realm. Um, but the module, the, I think, and, and that's uh, probably what we're looking for. Um, the, the difference I believe is that the module graph, when constructed, has nothing to do with a specific uh, compartment. Yes, the modules in that graph be, uh, are tied to one compartment. The one-to-one -one mapping between the module that you're about to internship and the compartment that you want uh, that code to be evaluated. But in general, the module graph is a, a level above that. It doesn't care much about what are the compartments and such. And I think that's an important um, different differentiation. And, and then uh, the, the second one is that we, we, we're missing the, the piece where the level of control and the lookup for the bindings uh, is done, which in this case, the compartment is only giving you the, the controls to the global object, not to the uh, actual binding that you are uh, uh, getting from another module, from another compartment, or from another row. I'm sorry, what, what do you mean by binding that's not a binding on the globals? The, the binding, the import bindings, when you are evaluating the, the, a module the, that has- The import namespace. The, comp the compart I'm saying the compartment is both a uh, determines the import namespace and determines the global. That that's those are both provided on a per compartment basis. Import namespace. Yeah, the import namespace. That's where the that's where the module map portion of the compartment comes in. Um, um, uh, which, what, what is the what is the uh, import namespace? The import namespace is the mapping from a specifier string. I'm sorry, let, let, let's, let's deal with the internal concept before we deal with the API concept. Um, uh, the internal concept is that the um, module map of a compartment is a mapping from a specifier string to either a module static record or a, uh, a module instance. If it's a mapping to a module static record, then uh, that means that um, uh, that is that importing that in this namespace will cause that module to be uh, instantiated in this compartment uh, if it's import if that specifier string is imported in this compartment um, then it's instantiated in this compartment if it's a module name if it's a module instance then importing that name in this compartment will um, uh, that that name is, is bound to that to that module instance that's already in your um, in your per compartment module map.
Mm. Yeah, that describes the Quran API. No, I'm sorry, yes, it describes the internal state behind the current compartment API. That's correct. It's the internal state. The difference is that, we're, that we were not proposing to reify as objects in the programming language the module static record or the module instance. Um, uh, so, so what we were doing in the exposed API it, that turns into that internal state is that the module map maps from a specifier name to either parent specifier name or module namespace object. And the reason we say module namespace object is that a module namespace object is exactly one-to-one -one with a module instance. So you can use a module namespace object to talk about the module instance that it's the namespace from. And when you, when you just use the name to name mapping, what that means is whether or not the parent has an instance of this module, uh, fetch the module static record from this name in the parent's namespace and then freshly instantiated in the child. And, 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 and you that, do that and you do that just because you want because you you want to eliminate identity discontinuity or because you want to uh, no. guarantee that it uses the same globals or different globals and such same global the we're we're actually causing identity discontinuities by multiple instantiation uh, it makes the identity discontinuity it introduces an identity discontinuity problem to multiply instantiate a module uh, so it becomes a policy decision as to whether you'd l rather live with the identity discontinuity or you'd la rather live with the communications channel, the coupling of state. Uh, and what Modable has done, what Modable has done until now, uh, is only done the name to, to name mapping with the separate instantiation. They actually, until this latest round of collaboration, uh, they actually did not have an ability to reuse a module instance. All they could do is reinstantiate it in a per compartment basis. So the re so um, so they they've agreed that this API, where you can wire it up to an already ex already instantiated module, or you can grab the module static record and reinstantiate it in this compartment. Uh, uh, bo both they and us like this API. And just to clarify, you're saying that even if I map it to a namespace object, there will be a new module that will get evaluated, new instance. No, 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 no. I'm saying the opposite. It's the name to name mapping that causes new instantiation. The name to namespace mapping causes reuse of an existing module instance. Because the namespace, first of all, means that the mod, that, that you're, uh, well, the, name, the, the main thing is a namespace and a module instance is exactly one-to-one. -one. So you can use the namespace to talk about the module instance without having to create a new kind of reified concept in the spec. Okay, so I'll, I'll send an email with the with the, um, the evaluator notes um, on the API is the one that I show. Um, okay. I'll try to prepare something more formal for next week. Let's see if I can get JDP to join us as well. Okay. And, and see if we can uh, communicate um, what, what, what we're trying to do and um, um, one might be needed at uh, the uh, compartment or uh, the compartment level in order to provide the level of control that we would like to exercise. Okay. Um, uh, we be, I believe, I believe that uh, if we have the level of control at the module level, and that means that when you are creating a module graph, you have to tell 
this is the module static uh, record or any other way of, of signaling to a module and this is the 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 or these are the hooks that I'm interested on in order to uh, modulate what the module body will attempt to do and the lookup that it will try to do um, that opens the door for many different ways of achieving uh, um, sandboxing and controlling what a particular module is attempting to do. Um, and there are some intersection there with the, with the level of control that we want for something evaluated inside the, 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 the compartment. And that, that's what I think there's a, a, a missing link here somewhere. Okay. Um, so uh, please do remember to send that URL. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Um, and good. Well, I look forward to the discussion next week. All right. Bye. Okay. Later, guys. Okay.